and welcome to Business 360. I'm Ritu Singh and here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. Sensex and Nifty gained for the fifth straight session despite some wild swings in late trade. Mid-caps underperformed. The Indian rupee remains near record low levels against the dollar. Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee will announce its rate decision tomorrow, as CNBC TV18 poll highlights. A majority of the economists do not expect a repo rate cut, despite a lower than expected GDP print. Only 50% expect a cash reserve ratio cut tomorrow. Bitcoin crosses $100,000, gaining 140% in 2024 and nearly 50% since Donald Trump's victory. The rally gathered momentum after Trump announced plans to appoint crypto-friendly Paul Atkins as the next chair of the U.S. Securities Market Regulator. Indian corporate sector has never had it so good as it has in the last four years. Now it is time to engage in a good combination of capital formation and employment growth as well. Chief Economic Advisor to the government says corporate profits are up fourfold in four years, but compensation to employees has been weak. Calls on India Inc. to review its hiring process and undertake capital expansion. Also says deregulation will be the theme of the upcoming economic survey. Devendra Fadnavis is all set to take oath as Maharashtra's Chief Minister at Mumbai's Azad Maidan. Ajit Pawar to take oath as Deputy Chief Minister. Shinde keeps the suspense going. No formal announcement on whether he will join the government. Amnesty International says Israel's war in Gaza tantamounts to a genocide. At least 21 people killed after Israeli forces bombed a so-called safe zone in Gaza. India's Foreign Minister Jay Shankar tells the parliament India will continue to support a two-state solution. Also says defense cooperation with Israel is based on national security interest. Brian Thompson, the CEO of United Health Group's insurance business, is shot dead outside a New York hotel. He was 50 years old. The police calls it a premeditated attack, but it is yet to identify the killer who remains at large. From food delivery to sporting events to concierge services, Zomato and Swiggy are busy diversifying into new areas not necessarily related to their core business. Will it pay off? A special report coming up. Well, let's start with the stock market action of the day, where the Sensex and the Nifty gained for the fifth straight session, but it was a wild ride on Dalal Street. Both the indices almost paired all of the gains in the last hour of trade, but there was a recovery in the last few minutes, and both Sensex and Nifty ended with gains of about a percent. Now, mid-caps and banks relatively underperformed today. Prashant Nair is standing by with the action of the day. Prashant. It was a good start, a positive start, about 100 points higher at 9.15 this morning. Uh, but, I mean, that was, of course, just the beginning because it was a roller coaster of a day. Uh, the Nifty up on your screen, you can see what happened, but you really can't, uh, you know, uh, imagine the quantum of those moves on the intraday graph up on your screen. So let me just uh, put the picture clearly. Uh, you know, you had basically four episodes uh, today. 12 noon is essentially when the first big move happened, 12 to about uh, 12... 17. In 17 minutes, the market and the Nifty went up 300 points. Uh, you know, then, of course, it uh, flatlined there at a high level. 210 onwards, there was another move which lasted till about 240. That was another 200-point up move, surge, and that basically was the day's highest point. And 237 onwards, I mean, there was a very sharp decline on the other side. Uh, by uh, 257, which is basically about 20 minutes, the Nifty had sold off 330 points. There was, of course, another 250-point surge after that, 3 p.m. onwards, and that essentially gives you the close that we had. I mean, you know, you can blame uh, high premiums, you can blame the options market, uh, but, uh, you know, this is essentially uh, the sum total of what you saw, huge amount of volatility through the course of the day. Uh, now, uh, banks, of course, the Nifty Bank had a positive session, although we closed off the highs uh, by about a half a percent or so. It looked very good at one point. The Nifty IT index was the clear winner, not very much dithering there. I think we end about 2% in the green for the Nifty IT as well. Mid caps and small caps, positive. Broader market, market breadth looking positive as well. I'll start with stocks here. TCS, Infosys, the biggest gainers. Trent, Titan. I mean, actually, a lot of Tata Group companies here. Dr. Reddy's, Bharti and Wipro were some of the other big winners. Uh, not very many by way of losers today. I'll start straight with broader markets and what did very well. Capital market plays, BSC, CDSL, Angel One. Uh, there were these financial names from the non-bank side, Bajaj Housing. Credit access was up 6% today. 
IGL, Castrol, Maharashtra Seamless from the industrial space, Skipper, Afcons, Phenolex cables. There was a name like PCBL, Anand Rati, and Infa, which were sharp volume-led gainers as well. Some profit booking coming through in names like NTPC Green, Graphite India sold off a little bit. There was Amber, Oil India, Shri Cements, Genus Power, and Nelco, which were some of the names which fell back. Nifty at very critical levels, 50% retracement of the full decline at about 24,770. I think we end around that. And of course, the Nifty Bank is just about one and a half odd percent away from all-time highs. Back to you. Well, Prashant, thanks very much for wrapping up the day's action for us. But from the stock market to the money market now, the Indian rupee continues to hover around record lows against the dollar. The Monetary Policy Committee is going to announce its rate decision tomorrow with the second quarter GDP growth slowing to its lowest level in 21 months. Now, there is a growing chorus for a repo rate cut, including from government officials. But this is coming at a time when inflation has breached RBI's tolerance threshold and continues to be a spot of bother. Now, a CNBC TV 18 poll shows that 7 in 10 economists do not expect the lower GDP print to accelerate the rate cut cycle. They believe that primacy of inflation will prevail in this policy. The MPC is also expected to leave the repo rate unchanged at 6.5% for the 11th consecutive policy. A rate cut at this point could accentuate the pressure on the currency and of course inflation hovers high. Now while a rate cut can be ruled out with inflation at above 6%, there could be an explicit acknowledgement from the RBI that growth needs support as well and as a step towards eventual easing, the RBI may instead go for a CRR or a cash reserve ratio cut. Now the respondents here are pretty divided on the possibility of this happening. Only half of them expect a CRR cut in the range of 25 to 50 basis points which should help ease some of the liquidity for the banking system. Now going ahead, there are still a few that are expecting a rate cut tomorrow and brokerage Nomura is one of them. Take a look. Uh, monetary policy, our view is that the RBI should cut uh, tomorrow, right? Um, monetary policy has to be forward-looking. It has to be counter-cyclical. Um, so we not only have the first cut uh, in uh, on the 6th December policy meeting, but we have a deeper uh, rate cut cycle of 100 basis points. Uh, well, we'll shift focus now to the U.S., where Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has said that the central bank can afford to be a little more cautious about cutting interest rates now that the U.S. economy is in a stronger state. Powell's comments come from the New York Times Deal Book Summit, and they're crucial since the Fed is widely expected to cut interest rates when they meet later this month. Now, Powell also weighed in on whether the impending Trump presidency could put the Federal Reserve's autonomy at risk. Powell ruled out the possibility of a shadow Fed chair under the Trump administration. And further, the Fed chair also referred to Bitcoin as a speculative asset like gold and said that the virtual asset is not a competitor for the U.S. dollar. We, we were the last major central bank to cut and we're now on a path to bring rates back down to a more neutral level over time. But you're, you're right, the economy is strong, and it's stronger than we thought it was going to be in September. So the labor market is, is better, and the downside risks appear to be less in the labor market. Growth is definitely stronger than we thought, and inflation is coming a little higher. So the good news is that we, we can afford to be a little more cautious in, as, we, as we try to find neutral. Now, Bitcoin has crossed $100,000, gaining 140, 140% in 2024 and nearly 50% since Donald Trump's victory in the recent U.S. presidential elections. Now, with this, the crypto's market capitalization has crossed $2 trillion. Manisha Gupta joins us with more on this action. Manisha. Well, it's an exciting day, especially for the crypto community, because you have $100,000 on Bitcoin here. It was in 2014 that Bitcoin was at $100. And now in 2024, it's at $100,000. And the markets clearly are coming with very strong, bigger numbers for the next couple of years at this point in time. But with this now, the Bitcoin valuation or the market cap stands at a record $2 trillion. It is the seventh largest asset in the world with this kind of numbers there. If you look at the overall crypto market, the total valuation or the market cap stands at $3.86 trillion, which also is a record highs. And it's not just Bitcoin which has hit an all-time highs. You have other more scalable platforms like a Solana or a Ripple, which also have hit an all-time highs. So in this year, while the Bitcoin has gained up by 140%, you have Ether up by 70%, Ripple is up to 82%, Solana up 
31%. And it is uh, the case really. Many of these cryptocurrencies are up in triple digit percentage for 2024. The latest run-up comes in after the U.S. President-elect has named cryptocurrency advocate Paul Atkins as the SEC chairman. This is after Gary Gensler is offered to step down in the month of January. Apart from that, uh, the Trump, uh, the whole de uh, demeanor comes in as crypto-friendly president that in any case has been supporting many of these cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. The other few factors which also have been supportive in this year especially is one, it's a Bitcoin halving year that has always been a support. And then the U.S.-based spot uh, ET which was launched in January 2024 has accumulated 30 billion dollars within its uh, as a program the markets also are looking at a lot of corporate adoption institution buying as well mutual funds have been buying it for their uh, clientele as well that has been supportive and uh, the latest has been the Russian president saying that you cannot ban cryptocurrencies the Russian president also by the way has signed a uh, law classifying digital currencies as a form of property in foreign trade settlement under an experimental legal thing. Uh, with the kind of numbers that we're looking at, the markets do believe that 2025 could be a replica <laughs> of what we've done in this year till now. Well, Manisha, thanks very much for bringing us up to speed with that. Now, here's another story, important story that we're tracking today. A thrust on deregulation, a nudge to India Inc. to pay more and invest more, and a word of caution against over-interpreting the GDP data. CEA Anant Nageshwaran's remarks at an Asacham event served as a clarion call to the industry to hike their CapEx budget. Now, Nageshwaran urged the industry to review their hiring processes and undertake capital expansion. He said that corporate profits are up fourfold in four years, but compensation to employees has been weak. The CEA also stressed that India Inc. should adopt the mantra of maximizing rather than optimizing when it comes to R&D budgets. The CEA also said that India's underlying growth story remains intact amid global uncertainties and cautioned against over-interpreting the Q2 GDP data, which was at 5.4% lower than expected. He said, and I quote, we should not throw the baby out with the bath water, end of quote. Anand Nageshwaran also provided a sneak peek into the upcoming economic survey where he said that deregulation was required at the state and local government level to boost participation of female workforce. He said that would be a major theme in the upcoming economic survey slated to be released a day before the tabling of the union budget. The staff costs of private listed companies, whether it is information technology firms or general, has been coming down. In other words, compensation growth has been become weaker and weaker. Compensation to employees, and if you take out managerial compensation, this will look even more uh, uh, acute, the, the decline. And of course, corporates have used the profits to uh, uh, reduce their leverage, which is a good thing. They are deleveraged, their balance sheets are healthy. The focus has to be on this, the plumbing of deregulation that has to happen in state and local governments. We touched upon it quite a bit in the economic survey in July, and that is going to be the big theme. Deregulation or letting go is the big theme for the coming economic survey as well. And this is an example. If Indian businesses have to comply with all the rules for building guidelines. Small and medium enterprises may not even have one percentage of land available for actual production. India's research and development expenditure as a percentage of GDP is one of the lowest in the world. This is a dimension of where the tyranny of the small size is it's still, still there with us. And if we have to raise our manufacturing share of GDP to 25% or, or, or more and be embedded in global supply chain, we have to learn from the successes of Germany, Switzerland, and Japan, which is to increase what we call this proportion of small and medium enterprises, which in the German language is called the Mittelstand. Well, Zomato and Swiggy are attempting to move beyond food delivery and quick commerce with both the companies aiming to diversify into new areas. Now, is this going to pay off? Shilpa Rani Peta is standing by to answer just that. A gamble or a masterstroke, Shilpa? 
Well, you know, from food delivery to events to concert services, Swiggy and Zomato are now busy diversifying into newer areas and these are not necessarily related to their core business. Let's look at Swiggy first. What started as a pure food delivery platform entered quick commerce with Instamart in 2022 and then dining out with Dine Out acquisition in 2022. Now, the most recent foray, however, has been into sports and recreation through a subsidiary that will be engaged in sports team ownership, to, uh, you know, management, talent development. It will also look at acquiring broadcasting and sponsorship rights. Now, this is a subsidiary that is in the process of being incorporated. But in this direction, Swiggy has already dipped in its toes into the Pickleball craze, acquiring Team Mumbai for the inaugural season of the World Pickleball League. Now, diversification of sports and commercialization of all kinds of leagues has made sports a big business opportunity. In fact, a FIKI report pegs the India sports industry to be a $100 billion market by 2027, of which sports media market alone is estimated to be about $13.4 billion. But it's not just this. It is also testing a service marketplace called Yellow that will connect uh, users with lawyers, therapists, fitness trainers, astrologists and other professionals like that. It's also testing a premium membership called Rare, which is our exclusive access to high-end events. Now, let's look at Zomato. Zomato, we know, originally started as a restaurant discovery platform. But it, today, it has food delivery, it has quick commerce, it has hyper-pure, and it also has the going-out business. But Zomato's big foray recently was into events. It has just launched a new app called District that allows users to book tickets for movies, for live performances, etc. And it's taking on Book My Show. Now, this is also a very fast emerging space in India as the country's youth are now prioritizing experiential spending. Just look at the craze that we saw recently for Diljit or the Dua Lipa, the Maroon 5 or the up, uh, upcoming Coldplay concerts. So, no surprise then that the live events market in India is projected to reach 143 billion by 2026 and Zomato expects the gross order value of its going out business to be over 10,000 crore uh, rupees by FI20. Now, beyond this, Zomato is also piloting a concierge-like service and is also set to enter the at-home services space via Blinkit, where it will take on urban company. But are Swiggy and Zomato making the right bets or are they biting off more than they can chew? Well, experts say that businesses like Swiggy and Zomato will have to continuously innovate because the rapid growth in delivery might eventually taper off as the business matures. And analysts actually see a huge upside to, for example, for, to Zomato's foray into events. And as a supply constraint space, that represents a massive opportunity for growth. But how Swiggy and Zomato navigate these new businesses while also maintaining a sustainable and profitable growth trajectory, that will be key. Well, Shilpa, thanks very much uh, for taking us through that. Diversification is the name of the game. But we have to take a short break on that note. Up next, Devendra Fadnavis is all set to take oath as Maharashtra's Chief Minister at Mumbai's Azad Maidan. We'll get you all of the details of that ceremony and the suspense that's ongoing with Eknath Shinde when we return. You're watching Business 360. Now, the winter session of the parliament continues to see disruptions in both Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. The opposition benches engaged in sloganeering and staged a walkout marking recurrent adjournments on the ninth day of the session. Opposition MPs carried out demonstrations outside the parliament over the Adani issue and raised demands of a joint parliamentary probe over the recent bribery allegations. And the iconic Azad Maidan in the heart of Maharashtra's capital, Mumbai, is decking up for the grand swearing-in ceremony. Devendra Fadnavis of the BJP will be taking oath as the chief minister this evening. Ajit Pawar of the NCP will be taking oath as the deputy chief minister of the state. Shiv Sena leader Uday Saman said Eknath Shinde will be taking oath as deputy chief minister as well. 
Now, the oath ceremony promises to be a mega event. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and top BJP ministers are expected to be in attendance. Corporate captains, including Mukesh Ambani, Uday Kotak, film personalities, including Shah Rukh Khan, Salman Khan and Madhuri Dixit, are all expected to attend this ceremony. Several beneficiaries of the Larki Behen scheme, which provided, which rather proved to be a pivotal factor in the Mahayuti victory, are also attending this ceremony. And the Council of Ministers of Jharkhand government led by Hemant Soren took oath today. This comes a week after Soren took oath as the 14th Chief Minister of the State. Of the 11 MLAs who took oath as ministers, six are from the Jharkhand Mukti Morcha led by Soren. Four ministers are from Congress and one from the RJD. On that note, we're going to wrap up this edition of Business 360. Thanks very much for tuning in. But more news and updates will continue on the other side of this break. So stay with CNBC TV 18.